All right, everybody, it's Wednesday. That means it's time to talk this week anyway about Isaiah for a few minutes. You recollect that we are on this journey talking about the character of God. It started for us in Exodus when we noticed that God said some things about his nature uh, that we thought was rather fundamental uh, when he revealed himself as the I Am, the God who is present. In Hebrew, we might call it Yahweh. Jehovah, we call him the Lord in your English translations. He um, <clears throat> he holds this notion of God being present, God hearing the cry that comes out of the darkness, God answering that cry, bringing liberation. He holds all of that central to what it means to call him the I Am, or to Yahweh, or to Jehovah. And of course, it's what played out in the Israelite story in Exodus. And we've been noticing that it's played out in a variety of other places. And up until last week, we've been looking at fairly explicit retellings of that sort of story. So Abel's blood cries out from the ground in um, Genesis chapter 4. God hears that cry and he answers. Or uh, the mothers of Bethlehem cry out in Matthew chapter 2. And God hears that cry and he answers with Jesus. And the martyrs cry out in the first uh, telling of the story in Revelation. And God hears that cry and he answers. But starting last week, uh, we st started to broaden our scope a little bit. Uh, looking at a series of stories, the first one last week, the second one this week. A uh, series of stories in the book of Isaiah where the language that we've been discussing so far isn't explicitly used, but the theme is there. And what it does, is going to do is it's going to serve as a bridge between the kind of those explicit stories like we find in Exodus or Genesis or Revelation and um, this broader discussion of how Jesus brings uh, liberation, how Jesus answers the cry of those in the darkness. Um, and so last week we talked about Isaiah 7 through 9, about the um, king in Jerusalem, Ahaz, and how the Israel, Israelite king in the northern kingdom of Israel, the Syrian king, decided to take him out. And so he, rather than trusting in God, partners with the Assyrian king who comes down and wipes them out. But Isaiah tells him the Assyrians aren't going to stop with them. Uh, rather, they're going to come down and they're going to take you out too. And so what we have is a story of four kings. And these kings meant to provide for the flourishing and the nourishment of their people, to represent God and all of his goodness and his agenda. They end up bringing uh, violence and um, death, destruction, the very darkness that people have been crying out of. They create that darkness. And so it is in into that darkness out of which the cry comes in Isaiah 9 that um, Isaiah looks to the future. He dreams. He tells a story about the way things will someday be. And he says, one day, light is going to break into that darkness and joy is going to replace the, uh, the mourning, the despair, he says. And all of this is going to happen when uh, a child is born. And we're going to call him Wonderful Counselor. We're going to call him Mighty God. We're going to call him Ever Everlasting Father. We're going to call him Prince of Peace. And um, he is going to take the throne. This is in contrast to the four other kings. Uh, where they have created the darkness, he is going to bring light into the darkness. And righteousness and justice, peace, healing, these sorts of things are going to break loose. And this was important, we said, because um, two times in four chapters, the first four chapters of Matthew, for instance, Matthew would point back to the story, Isaiah 7 through 9, and he would say, this is what's happening in Jesus. This is God coming into the darkness and uh, making an answer to those who cry out in the darkness. And so today I want to look at another story in Isaiah. And this one starts in um, Isaiah 36. And the first one was Ahaz. Ahaz was the king in Jerusalem, and Ahaz was among the worst kings to sit on the throne in Jerusalem. Uh, there is not a whole lot we could say about Ahaz because Ahaz um, was faithless. He was wicked. He was corrupt. He was violent. He um, flaunted his faithlessness in uh, God's face when God came in and said, I will take care of the Syrians. I will take care of the Israelites. Just ask me for a sign. Oh, I don't need a sign. I wouldn't presume uh, to need a sign from God. But really what he was doing was partnering with the Assyrians. Um, in Isaiah 36, we have generations later, uh, or a generation later, Hezekiah is the king of Jerusalem. 
And Hezekiah is among the best kings to have set the throne in Jerusalem. He uh, was a man who seems to have genuinely, genuinely tried to do what was right, to do what, do what was best for the people of God, who um, tried to uphold with some integrity and some faithfulness uh, the sort of vision that God has for kings. And we see that coming out in this story. Um, Isaiah 36 comes across when the uh, prophecy of Isaiah 7, 8, and 9 is starting to come true, at least the destruction part. Because in Isaiah 7 and 8, what Isaiah tells Ahaz is you've opened the door to the Assyrians, and they're going to come in, and they're going to bring destruction, and they're going to bring despair, and they're going to bring darkness. And, and in Isaiah 36, it's the Assyrians who have laid siege to Jerusalem. Uh, they've marched in from the north. They have taken care of the Syrians. The Assyrians took care of the Syrians. Just make sure I enunciate those right. Uh, they have taken care of the Israelites, but then they kept straight marching right into Judea. They wiped out all of the cities and the fortresses and the strongholds up to Jerusalem as they have marched south. And now they have laid siege to Jerusalem. And the Assyrian leader uh, sends Hezekiah a message. It says essentially you can either uh, cooperate with us or we're going to squish you like a bug. I mean, that's the technical, theological language. And don't presume that your God is going to save you. Everybody else said that their gods would save them as well, and it hasn't worked for any of them, so why do you think that your God would save you? So you need to make up your mind what you're going to do. And so Hezekiah, having received the letter uh, in this, this beautiful, powerful great moment in his life uh, he goes into the temple and he lays the ultimatum out before the Lord and he pleads with God for deliverance I, I love the imagery there he he goes into the temple and he, he treats God as if God were really there because God was really there and he pleads with the Lord for deliverance and so what happens is night falls on the Assyrian army besieging Jerusalem and uh, the Lord brings his judgment on the Assyrian army and um a huge, enormous chunk of the Assyrian army dies in the night. And I think it was the King James, one of the older translations says, the next morning they woke up dead. Um, the Assyrian army had been decimated in the night. The judgment of the Lord came down upon them. And um, so they, the Assyrians, run away. And it's interesting, um, the Bible says they ran away because they have been defeated. There are actual records from the Assyrians about this. And, you know, the king of Assyria says, we went to this town and we destroyed it in this town and destroyed it. We took over this nation, went to this nation. We came to Jerusalem and we sieged it, besieged it. And uh, we just decided to go home, right? So we have beginning this beautiful moment of faithfulness for my, or Hezekiah. Hezekiah demonstrates his faithfulness. Lord, deliver us. He did precisely what Ahaz should have done, and God was faithful to his promise. Um, and so we start off saying, this is a good story. And then we have a second chapter of the story, the story in which Hezekiah gets sick, and it becomes clear that he is going to die. And so Hezekiah prays to the Lord for deliverance, and the Lord um, delivers Hezekiah. 15, I believe, 15 more years of life. And so, um, once again, Hezekiah, the model of a faithful king. Uh, but it's interesting what Isaiah says next as we move towards chapter 39. Uh, what Hezekiah does with those 15 years of life is that he then, for reasons that are not explained in the text, but he courts and he enters into relationship with the Babylonians. And um, at this point in history, the Assyrians have been the big dudes on the block for quite a while. Uh, but the times are changing. The Babylonians are on the rise. The Assyrians are on the fall. It won't be long before the Assyrians are defeated by the Babylonians. The Babylonians become the global superpower. And um, everything we say about the Assyrians, we could say about the Babylonians as well. They were cruel, they were violent, they were bloodthirsty, they were warmongers, they were imperialistic, they um, delighted in capturing nations and expanding 
their borders. Uh, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, both. They were not good people. Uh, but Hezekiah enters into a relationship. He uh, begins to, to court to, to make tentative moves of being in alignment with the Babylonians. <clears throat> so Isaiah comes to him at the end of chapter 39. And he basically says the same thing that he had said to Ahaz a generation before. Um, let, me, let me just read it to you. This is Isaiah 39, uh, starting in verse 5. Um, and Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of Yahweh, that is um, the Lord, that is the God who is present, that is the I Am, right? This is the name that was given the burning bush, the name that they gave uh, he gave to Israel, this is who I am. This is Exodus 6 stuff, right? Um, hear the word, of the, the word of Yahweh of hosts. Look, days are coming and all that is in your house and that which your ancestors have stored up to this day shall be carried off to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says Yahweh. And some of your sons who go out from you, whom you fathered, shall be taken and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. And so, um, well, let me just stop there for a minute. He, he says, um, because you've opened this door to Babylon, just like Ahaz opened the door to Assyria, um, you have invited death and destruction, exile, darkness, right, onto the life of your people. Um, and the way he answers in verse 8, Hezekiah said to Isaiah, The word of Yahweh that you have spoken is good. Isaiah just came and said, Your uh, nation is going to be plundered. Your people are going to be destroyed. There's going to be despair and judgment and violence and doom. And they're going to be taken off into exile. And your lineage is going to be broken. And they're going to be servants in the palaces of the king of Babylon. And Hezekiah says, the word that you have spoken from the Lord is a good word. And um, up to this point, Hezekiah has been this model of faithfulness. So we're trying to, to wrap our minds. How in the world can he say something like this? This is what he says. Uh, For he thought, this is the last verse of chapter 39, surely there will be peace and security in my days. Um, Hezekiah, you've opened the door to the destruction of your nation to the end of your line, to the uh, hurt of your people. And he says, nah, it's not going to happen while I'm alive, so it's okay. And so I want to stop for uh, just a second through chapter 39. I want to take stock of this story. I want you to hear the kind of story that is being told. Because this is, just like in Isaiah 7 through 9, this is a story about kings, Right? You have Hezekiah, the king in Jerusalem. You have the Assyrian king, whose armies surround Jerusalem at the first part. And then you have the Babylonian kings. And the end result of this story of kings is the same as in Isaiah 7 and 8. There is destruction. There is death. There is uh, brokenness. There is this overwhelming darkness out of which this cry um, inevitably and always comes forth. And what's telling about this, this retelling of the same story a generation later, it's like second verse, same as the first. What, what's telling about this recounting of the story, though, is that in um, 7, 8, 9, Ahaz was a wicked king. And the darkness is what we end up with in the face of such a wicked king. Um, in Isaiah 36 through 39, Hezekiah was a good king. Hezekiah did everything right. His problem wasn't that he was wicked. His problem here was, if anything, that he was inept. Uh, he just didn't know what he was getting into. And um, even in his best attempt, Isaiah says, we still end up with this darkness. And that's what I was trying to get at last week. You know, it was Inauguration Day in the United States. And talk about how no matter how much we like this president or that president or before that um, this king or that king or prime minister or, or whoever the leader may be we always at the end of the day end up with these these problems that still plague our world uh, this darkness still prevails upon the world and this cry still comes up out of the darkness and so even our best attempts at fixing things and making things right they don't they don't turn out the way we want them to one of the reasons why we continually 
talk about how this election is the most important election in the history of the world. Um, in some sense, we've always said things like that. You can go back and look at the records, and we've always said that. But one of the reasons we keep saying things like that is uh, that no matter what the previous administration has done, good or, or bad, um, the brokenness is still there. They haven't addressed, they haven't fixed the brokenness. And in many ways, uh, whether it's a good leader or a bad leader, they've made the brokenness worse, depending on where you stand and, and who you are. So the darkness prevails. And so in Isaiah 36 through 39, what you see, it's a story of kings. And this time it's a good king and a couple of wicked kings, but a good king. And even the good kings um, managed to make a mess of things. It's like the human characteristic. We're good at that. We manage to make a mess of things. Um, but then, by the way, Isaiah 39 marks the end of one of the major divisions of the book of Isaiah. Uh, chapter 40 marks the beginning of the next major division. It ends on this note of doom and destruction and uh, the momentarily at least faithless Hezekiah. Uh, but then chapter 40, 40, Isaiah 40 starts with these words. L listen to what it says. Okay, ends with doom and destruction, despair, exile, plunder. And the first word of Isaiah 40 is comfort. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. And speak to the heart of Jerusalem and call to her that her compulsory, compulsory labor is fulfilled, that her sin is paid for, that she has received from the hand of Yahweh double for all her sins. And so um, as we change, change pages from Isaiah 39 to Isaiah 40, right? Isaiah goes from this vision of doom and destruction because of what Hezekiah has done uh, to a time in the future where um, God is going to bring comfort to the people who have been beaten down, who have been broken, who have been afflicted by uh, the darkness of this world. Their sins, sins of people like Hezekiah, all those who went with him, uh, has brought this judgment on, has brought this doom on, this, this destruction, this despair on Jerusalem. But now God is going to speak a word of comfort. And uh, we might say, where does this comfort come from? Because the darkness is um, the sort of thing that lasts and lasts and lasts and lasts. I mean, it never seems to stop. So what comfort? Where comfort? What hope? Why should we... Um, believe this word of comfort if even the good kings like Hezekiah make a mess of things where's this comfort going to come from uh, but what God does in Isaiah 40 down through the next uh, several verses is he he says in essence he says I am going to come and I'm going to be the king and I will get right all of those things that all of those other things have gotten wrong. And where they have made a mess of things, I will clean those things up. And where they have been sometimes even unintentionally unjust, I am going to be just. And where they have been unrighteous, I'm going to be righteous. And where they have been violent and have broken the world, I am going to be peaceful and bring healing to the world. So he says in a passage we're familiar with, starting in verse 3, the first two verses, Comfort, comfort, speak comfort to Jerusalem, because a voice is calling in the wilderness, clear the way of Yahweh. This is the God who hears the cry, the God who is present, the God who answers the I am. Clear the way of Yahweh, make a highway smooth in the desert for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, every mountain and hill shall become low. And the rough ground shall be like a plain, and the rugged ground like a valley plain. And the glory of Yahweh shall be revealed, and all humankind together shall see it. I want you to notice how this little text begins and, and ends. We have this imagery of uh, valleys being filled up, of mountains being brought low, of, of the road being prepared, right? Uh, but it begins with, in verse 3 and then down in verse 5, as this speech begins and ends, it says, Yahweh, the God who is present, the God who hears the cry, the, the Lord, Yahweh is coming, right? 
these other kings have let you down, but Yahweh is coming, and that is the source of this comfort. Well, what's Yahweh going to do when he comes? Verse 6, a voice is saying, Call, and he said, What shall I call? All humankind are grass, and all its loyalty is like the flower of the field. Grass withers, the flower withers. When the breath of Yahweh blows on it, surely the people are grass. Grass withers, the flower withers, but the word of our Lord will stand forever. I want you to go make a pronouncement. What sort of pronouncement am I supposed to make? We are a bunch of faithless people. He says in verse 9, he says, Get yourself up to a high mountain on Zion. That's where the temple was. A bringer of good news. That's evangelist, gospel, good news. The good news of victory, right? Lift up your voice with strength, Jerusalem. Bringer of good news. Lift it up. You must not fear. Say to the cities, here is your God. So again, that theme, God is coming. Here he is. Announce the news. That is evangelism. That is uh, to be an evangelist. To announce the news that God has come. And he says in verse 10, he says, Look, the Lord Yahweh comes with strength, and his arm rules for him. Look, his reward is with him, and his recompense in his presence. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arm. He will carry them in his bosom. He will lead those who nurse. Um, <clears throat> so he, he says, Yahweh is coming. We need to announce he's coming. Prepare the way he's coming. Get up on a high place and yell, Here is Yahweh. And then uh, when Yahweh shows up, he, starting in verse 10, uses this royal language, kingly language. Um, he is going to rule with the strength of his arm. He is going to shepherd his sheep. Um, in the Israelite economy, where the, um, the king of kings up to this point, the king that has their picture in the dictionary next to the word king is David, who was a shepherd to talk about somebody ruling with the strength of their arm and shepherding the flock. That is royal language. Kings were seen as shepherds in that culture. And he is going to care for, in verse 11, his people. Right? Contrast this to what we saw just the chapter before where Hezekiah says, destruction, despair, violence, not a big deal. I'll be dead, not my problem. Uh, compare that with the king of Assyria and the king of Babylon. Compare that with King Ahaz a generation before or the Israelite king or the Syrian king or the king of Assyria at that time. And what God is saying is contrasted to all of these kings, I am going to come and I am going to be king and I am going to get right all of the things that they got wrong. And so um, we have this story again. The darkness prevails, the brokenness prevails, the cries often come out of the darkness, and Yahweh, <clears throat> the God who is present, the one who hears, he is the one who answers that cry. He is, in this sense, answering that cry by coming into the darkness, judging the kings who have brought about or perpetuated the darkness, and he is going to be king in their stead. He is going to get things right. And by the way, this notion of God coming as king in the New Testament, there's a word for that, or a phrase rather. It is called the kingdom of God. And what is it that Jesus pronounces as the heart of his entire ministry? Uh, the time has come near. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel, the good news, the, the word that Isaiah alludes to here in Isaiah chapter 40. And so this is important for us because this is the text in Matthew chapter 4. Uh, down about verse 17, precisely when Matthew has Jesus beginning his ministry and Jesus goes around preaching the gospel, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, repent and believe the good news. He says this was done to fulfill what Isaiah was talking about. Um, so this is in Isaiah 3 uh, with John the Baptist, the one who came to prepare the way. Um, his message was the same, the gospel is at hand or the, good, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, repent and, and believe the good news. Um, he used that as a way of letting us know what was going on. You remember back in Isaiah 40 when there were the bad kings and then God was going to come as king. But before he came as king, there was going to be this messenger who says, God is coming. God is coming. Here is God. Um, he says, John, in the opening verses of chapter 3 in Matthew, John is, that, John is that messenger. He's the one who's saying that God has heard the cry. God has seen into the darkness and sees your plight and he understands where it comes from and he is going to sweep aside all of those other 
kings. And he is going to plant himself as king. And doing that, he's going to get right all of the things all of those other kings get wrong. John is the messenger that announces the beginning of that. And so John goes out in the wilderness. It's time to repent because the kingdom of God is coming. And who shows up? Jesus shows up. And John baptizes Jesus in Matthew chapter 3. And um, when Jesus comes up out of the water, a dove, the spirit in the form of a dove, descends on him. He is anointed. Um, you anoint kings, right? Messiah is a word for the Jewish king. It is a word that literally means the anointed one. Christ is the Greek form of Messiah, the anointed one. The Spirit is poured out on him in the form of a dove from heaven, and the voice from heaven says at his baptism, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And in the Israelite way of looking at things, one of the major meanings of the Son of God was to say, the King. So John says, God is coming as King. You need to get ready. And then Jesus comes and he is baptized. He is anointed by the Spirit, not just oil, it's the Spirit. And um, the heavens pronounced, this is the king. So what's Jesus there to do? He's there to set things right. He begins to proclaim the good news, the gospel, the good news of victory that Isaiah talked about. He's to bring a word of comfort. He's going to set things right where all the other kings have um, enabled and pushed forward the darkness. And so this is all a story that is central to God's nature as the one who hears the cry coming out of the darkness. Um, Matthew uses this story in Isaiah 7 through 9 to frame what it is that Jesus is doing. Okay, so I just I want to kind of hit you with that. Next week we're going to go back to um, something I forgot to do earlier. I wanted to take a look before we got to this at Romans 8. I think it's important before we get too far away from some of the other texts that we've been talking about to talk about. Romans 8. Um, and then after that, we're going to continue looking at this theme that we're starting to pick up in Isaiah. We want to start giving more specificity to it. Uh, what does it look like, particularly when Jesus comes as king, when he hears the cry, when he answers the cry? What does that mean for us? How can we participate in this? And uh, just a reminder that this is not recorded live. I record it at lunch on Wednesdays. I upload it whenever I can when I get home. Uh, sometimes that means you don't get around to this till Thursday. Sometimes I get it done on Wednesday night. I'm just doing what I can here, guys. And um, if you want to leave a comment or a question, you can text me. You can leave it in the comments on uh, YouTube or on Facebook, wherever you find this at. And we will have a really good conversation. All right. I hope you guys have a good week and uh, take it easy. Bye.